super excited to introduce you to two people that have changed my life forever, two people that mean uh, the world to me. They're two people that have taught me more about God, who he is, what it looks like for me to live according to God's will, be like Jesus in my own life. These two people have literally changed me and made me who I am. The first is my grandfather. Uh, what's interesting about my grandpa is I've actually lived more life now without him than I lived with him. But he stays with me because he infused some things into my psyche, into my heart and soul that I just can't seem to shake. Uh, most of which is just what it looks like to live every day for Jesus. That's who my grandpa was. I remember spending the night over at their house and uh, waking up early and going out and finding him at the little table in their kitchen, Bible open, toast in hand, having his time with the Lord. I remember one time we were at the duplex that my grandparents owned and the tenants had moved out. We were helping get it ready for the next group coming in. And there was this gigantic iron desk down in the basement. I mean, it was the biggest heaviest desk I'd ever seen in my life. And we needed to get it out of there, but we couldn't get it up the stairs. We couldn't fit it through the door. We came to the conclusion that they must have put it in when the foundation was poured and built the house over the top of it because it was that big. And we had spent all morning with sledgehammers and, I don't know, axes and all that kind of stuff just pounding on this thing, and we could not get it apart. And I was starting to get to the place where I was going to lose my mind. I'm just angry. And I remember my grandpa taking a step back, and he used to kind of, when he was thinking, he'd do his hand like this, and this was his conclusion, Josh, go, go ask Granny to get us some tacos. We need a break. <laughs> and we just sat and ate lunch, and then eventually we went back to it, and it was like an all-day thing, but he never got angry. He never lost his temper, anything like that. He, he really was patient and like Jesus, and I remember... Just before he died, he's literally on his deathbed. He's got his hands in the air, and he's singing his way to heaven. I mean, he just, he lived it. He just really taught me, this is what it looks like, start to finish, to live for Jesus. The second, you might not expect, uh, the second is my oldest son, Jake. Uh, God, one of God's greatest gifts to me was giving me children. And not in a like it way of like I got a lot of kids and that's a blessing, in a way that God has taught me more about himself through putting me in this odd place of being called dad. But Jake has taught me over and over again through our interaction who God the Father is. Because I love Jake no matter how many times he upsets me. No matter how many times he loses his jacket in the dead of winter, no matter how many times he breaks the rules or whatever, I, I love him. I'm crazy about that kid. And I know what it means because of him to when God disciplines us in our life. Not because he's mean, but because he loves us. And Jake has taught me too what it looks like to value God more than anything else. Perfect example. It's cool when God gives you a sermon illustration like two days before your sermon. Jake was at a camp for the last couple days for outdoor ed with his school. And while he was gone, his youngest brother, Sawyer, proceeded to dump an entire glass of orange juice on Jake's brand new Xbox that he got for Christmas. And it will not turn on. And we brought, Jake got home, we sat him down, and you know what he said? It's just a thing, Dad. That's not how Dad reacted when the spill occurred. <laughs> so you can see I'm learning from my children. <laughs> my kids are teaching me about loving Jesus. My kids are teaching me what it means to grow to be like him. And he's less than half my age. So it's been interesting as I've reflected on what we're going to talk about this morning to see I have people in my life that are 
literally on opposite ends of the age spectrum that, had, that have had equal impact in my life. But it can be hard, right? It can be hard for those of you who are in the younger generations to look up to and listen to the older generation because they just don't get it, right? They, they don't know what we're facing. They, they've never been down this road before. That's what we tell ourselves, right? So we, we can't pay attention to them. And it can be difficult for the older generations to listen to the younger generations because they're just young and they don't get it and they haven't lived life yet and all of that kind of stuff. It can be really hard because we're so different to listen to each other and to coexist and be in the same room sometimes. You see this play out in your own family, right? If you have children, if you're a mom or a dad and you have your own kids, you understand how difficult it can be for two people who are in very different places when it comes to their generational placement to get along. Because mom and dad want to instruct the child on how to live life. And the child wants to instruct the parent on how they want to live their life. And it can be, it can be fireworks all the time between the parent and the child because they're from very different places. You see it at work all of the time, right? The seasoned veteran and the rookie. Why aren't they having lunch more? Because they're from very different places. That seasoned veteran's seen the company change and grow and expand and all of that kind of stuff, and the rookie's coming in and standing on his shoulders and doesn't even know it. And they have a hard time listening to each other because the young gun coming in wants to use technology and all of this kind of stuff, and the veteran says, well, that's just not how we've done it before. And it's worked till now. Why would we change it? Neither one of them are bad. It's just how we go through life. It becomes very prevalent when it comes to things like technology, right? If you're in the older generations, uh, chances are your child or your grandchild are teaching you how to use your iPhone, right? Because they have, but they have something to teach us. And while younger generations think it's all awesome and it's great and we should just have it everywhere, the older generations are saying, be careful. Be careful. Don't let this run your life. And it feels like we're going like this. And it might surprise you to hear that it happens in families, it happens in the workplace, it's with technology, it happens in church. I know that sometimes we want to believe that the church is this safe haven from any kind of worldly dysfunction. Uh, but we're not immune. And the church is this place where, especially at a church like ours, which is the best part of our church, is all kinds of generations from all kinds of walks of life come together, and we're trying to figure out how do we do this together? H- how do we be the church? How do we live this Christian life? How do we feel like we haven't been cast off or been ignored and actually function together? It's no wonder we have a hard time when you look at some of the studies that have been done when it comes to generations. So I'm going to give you like a three-minute crash course on generational differences. If you go home and you Google this, there's way more about this. But we're just going to look at a few things. I thought it would be helpful if first I gave you kind of what have become the traditional labels for generations. Um, probably the, the oldest living generation are what we call the builders. Uh, you might hear them referred to as the traditionalists. Lately, they're called the greatest generation um, in first service, when I said greatest generation, I got an amen. <laughs> but these are the people that were born 1916 to about 1945. And these are not, you know, hard, fast lines. This is just a, an approximate that sociologists have done on the generations. The generation that followed them is the biggest generation. They're called the baby boomers. And we all always hear about boomers and all of those kinds of things. They were born between 1946 and 19. 19- 64. (laughs) Like I said, they're the biggest generation. There's a lot of people here. Uh, After the boomers are what we call Generation X. These are the people born 1965 to 1980. I'm in Generation X. (laughs) And then the the last one that is coming into adulthood now, this is going to freak you out a little bit, we call them the Millennials. 
They were born between 1981 and 1991. Can you... Isn't it a little weird that we're calling people born in 1991 adults now? That weirds me out a little bit. There's another generation that's still really young, and lately they've been called Generation Z. We're still trying to figure them out, so we're not going to talk about them this morning. Um, but each of these generations are drastically different from one another when you begin to look at some of the things that have made them what they are, who they are. Let's start with some of the influences And a lot of these influences happened when they were young. This is when we're really shaped as people. So these are kind of the things that happened in the world when these generations were younger. For the builders, it was things like World War II, the Korean War, the Great Depression, and the beginning of what's called the Space Age, where we're starting to think about getting off the planet and out into the stars and all of that kind of stuff. That's all happening when the builders are young. And so that began shaping how they view the world and how they navigate the world. For the boomers, some of their influences were things like civil rights, the Vietnam War, the sex revolution, the Cold War, and actually getting into space. We now are, we see astronauts on the moon and all of those kinds of things. And for those of you who are boomers, you remember where you were when some of these things happened. You remember when the newscast came on And he said, this is one small step, right? And it shaped how you view the world. For the Xers, some of the influences for them were Watergate, which, by the way, Xers are known for having zero trust in the government. Because when they were young, things like Watergate was what the government gave them. Other things were single parents. We're now starting to see the rise in divorce and a greater number of families that just have a mom or a dad at home, not both together. A lot of corporate downsizing during their upbringing. Moms are starting to go to work, and like I said, the divorce rate goes up. That begins to shape how Xers view the world today. We don't always think about that. We think that how we view the world today is shaped by what happens today. But for most of us, it's shaped by what happened when we were younger and in our formative years. For millennials, more recent things like the rise of digital media, social media in particular, school shootings, right? Every other week, there seems to be a school shooting. That's happening as we're growing up. I can remember being in school when Columbine happened, and they put it on the TV, and we're watching this happen live, and I'm sitting in a classroom myself. The AIDS and us beginning to understand it and what it means and what it doesn't mean and starting to work on how are we going to treat it and those kinds of things. And the 9-11, of course, was maybe one of the most impactful times in the millennials' upbringing where the first time we were vulnerable or felt vulnerable and we were attacked. And those things happening in our life, regardless of the generation you are, shape how you navigate life today. Uh, Let's look at core values for these generations. This is where you really start to see those influences play out. For builders, I won't read them all, but things like adhering to rules, dedication, patriotism, saving, those are core values for the builder generation. For boomers, it's anti-war, anti-government, equal rights, work, expansion, and growth, and all of those kinds of things. For millennials, some of their core values, or Xers, core values, diversity, higher education, skepticism, global thinking, entrepreneurial spirit. All of that is who Xers are and how they tend to view the world. And then finally, millennials, all about achievement, all about civic duty, tolerance, spiritualism, realism, how those two work together and how do we create our truth and all of that kind of stuff. This is what these generations hold as value and they become the operating system that's happening behind the windows. Like on your computer, there's this magic thing called an operating system that's happening all the time while you're opening windows and closing windows. And this is our operating system, how a lot of us think. Again, not perfect and neat and tidy, but generally speaking. The last one I want to show you is just family experience because this factors into what makes us Different. For the builders, it was a very traditional family, very nuclear. Think beaver cleaver, right? Dad comes home from work. He takes his suit off and hangs it in the closet. Wait, that's Ro- Mr. Rogers. Um, I, don't, I never saw the beaver cleaver. But, you know, you all sit down at the table together and you eat and then you maybe watch the evening news together and all of that kind of stuff. That's how builders grew up in their family. For boomers, that began to disintegrate 
wasn't always the same because dad starts working more hours or dad has a couple jobs. And mom's at home and mom kind of becomes the primary um, source of care in the house. Then the Xers, first generation that we label latchkey kids. And these are the kids that come home from school and because mom is at work now, not at home, they're coming in, shutting the door and locking it so that no one can get in. They're the first generation that really lived that out. And then for millennials, merged families. Rise of divorce, we have single parents with their families. Now they get remarried, and it's you know a modern Brady Bunch where kids are living together that don't have the same two parents, and that changes the family dynamic drastically. And we have the arrival of what we call coddled kids or helicopter parents, uh, where the kid moves and the parent hovers over the top of them, making sure that they're always okay. And you know why that is? Because this parent was an exer who didn't have a parent home. And so you can see how you're brought up is shaped, or shapes how you live today. So with all of those differences in mind, it's no wonder that sometimes we have a very difficult time getting along because we quite literally have had different walks of life. We have different values. Our families are all different. And so when we say things like, you just don't understand me, in some way, it's true because we are that different. Now, you might be sitting here this morning going, what in the world does this have to do with Joseph? (laughs) What in the world does this have to do with church? The question I've been wrestling with as I've been coming to the last part of Joseph's life is this idea of generations. And if they're so different, how do we get along? But more than that is, does God even care about this? Does this matter to God? that we have generational differences and that we're all in the same room and we're all part of the same church or we're part of the same family or part of the same work group, does that really matter to God? And you know what I've come to conclude? Absolutely. In fact, I think it was part, it is part of God's design for things. I think that multiple generations are a part of how God set things up to work for the best. I want to show you what I mean by looking at a couple episodes from Joseph's life. Uh, We're going to be in Genesis chapter 47, if you want to turn there in your Bible. Uh, Genesis chapter 47. Here's the the scene that we're about to enter into. You'll remember, uh, Joseph has been made second in command of all of Egypt. He's revealed his identity to his brothers, and Pharaoh has invited the entire family to come live in Egypt and get the best of the best. And so that's exactly what happens. Joseph's brothers and his dad, Jacob, all move to Egypt. And they're living there now. And Joseph and Jacob have this really interesting relationship. You'll remember way back at the beginning, Joseph was Jacob's favorite. And everybody knew it. But then there's this long span of time where they're very disconnected. And Jacob thinks Joseph's dead. And Joseph has no idea what's going on with Jacob, and suddenly they've been reunited and brought back together in Egypt. And these episodes I want to look at are kind of going to show us how Joseph relates and views Jacob and vice versa. Two people from very different generations, but how do they act together and how does God use it? So I want to look at uh, Genesis chapter 47, and I want to start in verse 11. It says, So Joseph settled his father and his brothers in Egypt and gave them property in the best part of the land, the district of Ramses, as Pharaoh directed. Joseph also provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food according to the number of their children. Now you read that, and that might seem very vanilla. That's just history being recorded so that we know kind of, okay, now they're in Egypt. But if you study a little bit of the culture and how families functioned and their understanding of authority and all of those kinds of things, you begin to see this is a loaded couple of verses. Here's why. Joseph and his brothers, particularly Jacob with his dad and his dad's dad, lived in what's called a patriarchal society. Everything hinges on the patriarch of the family, the dad. 
That's, what, that's how the family's identified. That's how the family's respected and viewed and understood and all that. Everything is with the patriarch, the oldest living male. And everybody lives in their house, and it was, they were literally thought of as the ruling person for that family. So much so that they, it was understood that they had the authority over life and death for every living person in their household. So no one messes with dad. Nobody. No one tells dad what to do. He's essentially the king. Our dad's in here going, man, I wish I lived with one Joseph. <laughs> Patriarchal society. Dad cares for everybody. But when you read this passage, you begin to hear it's Joseph now that's taking care of dad. Upside down, backwards, countercultural counterintuitive from what they had always known. You see, what they're moving into is they're moving away from a patriarchal setup to more of a patronage setup, or what's referred to as patron-client. And this becomes even more real in New Testament times and how things work. But it's kind of a political way of understanding things. How it works is the client pledges allegiance to their patron, and then the patron blesses them and protects them and cares for them and that sort of thing. And the, the patron's kind of the influential power person. By the way, this is in some way where we get the idea uh, of a patron saint, right? They're the saint that cares for the person, right? So you see this start to happen here in that Jacob and the, other, and the brothers are clients of Joseph in Egypt, He's the patron. He's the one in charge. He's the one with the influence and the power and the land and all of that kind of stuff. And they're, because they're his family, there's like this baked-in allegiance. But he's the one caring for them now. It's inside out from how they had understood life for so long. And it would have been easy, really easy for Jacob to be like, who do you think you are? I'm the dad. You don't need to tell me how to do my business. I'll go talk to Pharaoh. Just a few verses earlier, Joseph actually sits the whole family down. He says, this is how you need to interact with Pharaoh. Here are the precise words that you need to say to him. It would have been easy for Jacob, the dad, to be like, listen, I'm the patriarch. I'll handle this. In the same way, it would have been easy for Joseph to kind of fade into the shadows and be like, I'm not messing with dad. I'm not going to try and tell him how to do things. I'm not going to get in his way. He's not going to listen to me anyway. But you begin to see this interesting phenomenon between the two people, Joseph and Jacob. There's this phenomenon called deferring. Now, sometimes we think of defer as like shove off and give responsibility to someone else. But in this sense, we're talking about respect. Mutual respect, mutual submission, and listening. And this, this plays out really, really beautifully, and we'll see this in a minute, that it goes both ways. But in this case, you see Jacob deferring to Joseph. Listen, you've got a lot to offer my generation, because I'm going to go hungry unless you help us. I won't have a place to live unless you help us. And this is what I'm learning. Jacob and Joseph are very different, but they still defer to one another. So... While every generation is different, every generation should be deferent. While every generation is different, every generation should be deferent. In other words, respectful of one another, listen to each other, have teamwork and coming together for the good of, in this case, the good of the family. The family, by the way, that God is going to turn into a great nation, you'll remember, as he promised Joseph's great-grandfather, Abraham. That's what stays at the center, and you'll, you'll see that in a minute. But I want to show you how this works both ways, because what I don't want is for you to walk out of here this morning and go, great, I just heard a sermon on how I should just give in to all the young people. That's not the case at all, because the young people need to be equally different to the older generation. Jump over to chapter 48 in Genesis. I'm going to read a big chunk for you because it's fascinating what happens when Joseph actually brings the next generation in to meet Grandpa, 
his kids, the kids that he's had in his time in Egypt, they're named Manasseh and Ephraim, and he brings them in to meet Granddad, and Granddad does things a little bit differently than Joseph had in mind. So chapter 48, uh, starting in verse 8, it says, When Israel, that's the other name for Jacob, saw the sons of Joseph, he asked, Who are these? Well, they are the sons God's given me here, Joseph said to his father. Then Israel said, Bring them to me so I may bless them. Now Israel's eyes were failing because of old age, and he could hardly see. So Joseph brought his sons close to him, and his father kissed them and embraced them. Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face again, and now God has allowed me to see your children too. Then Joseph removed them from Israel's knees and bowed down with his face to the ground. And Joseph took both of them, Ephraim on his right toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh on his left towards Israel's right hand, and brought them close to him. But Israel reached out his right hand and put it on Ephraim's head. Though he was the younger, and crossing his arms, he put his left hand on Manasseh's head, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. And then in verse 15 through and 16, he prays this blessing on them. But Joseph sees what, what Jacob is doing and takes issue with it, because the oldest is supposed to be the one that gets the blessing. Look at verse 17. When Joseph saw his father placing his right hand on Ephraim's head, he was displeased. So he took hold of his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. Joseph said to him, No, my father, this, is, this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He too will become a people, and he too will become great. Nevertheless, this younger brother will be greater than he, and his descendants will become a great, a group of nations. He blessed them that day and said, in your name will Israel pronounce this blessing. May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. So he put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. Now, that's a lot of story right there. But you can understand Joseph brings his sons in, and typically, the way Joseph was brought up was the oldest son got the blessing from the patriarch. But what Jacob does is he pulls the old switcheroo. And he gives the blessing to the younger. And Joseph gets a little bent out of shape about this and challenges his dad on it. But what's interesting is when his dad comes back with his response, what does Joseph do? Okay. Okay, Dad. It's not written out there, but you don't read that they do the blessing over. Joseph defers to his dad, shows respect, shows respect for Jacob's relationship with God, that he's walked with God for decades and decades and decades, understanding that in a lot of ways this is Jacob's right. And he defers to him. Instead of stomping his feet and getting angry and pushing his way around and getting loud and all of that kind of stuff, he accepts what his dad says and goes with it. So Joseph looks at life one way, Jacob is looking at life the other, and somehow they make it work because they understood that while each generation is different, every generation should be different. Yes, we're different. Yes, our backgrounds are, are on opposite ends of the spectrum and our experience is, is not the same. Jacob had lived all of his life in Canaan in the hills and doing the shepherding thing and, and here's Joseph, the big city boy in charge and big leader guy. But somehow, and if you read all of the chapters there, you see it happens over and over again where Joseph defers to Jacob and Jacob defers to Joseph and God's plan begins to unroll. And this great nation that he's been promising for generations happens and you go, well, how did they do it? If their generations are so different, how in the world did they actually make it work? I think the key is in actually chapter 46. If you turn to chapter 46 and you look at this interaction that Jacob has with God in verse 3, this is what it says, I am God, the God of your father, he said. 
Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down to Egypt with you, and I will surely bring you back again. And Joseph's own hand will close your eyes. You see, Jacob came to understand that God was in charge, that God was sovereign, and that God had a plan. And so when you ask, how does Jacob, a guy that's older and is the actual father of Joseph, listen to Joseph? It's because he's listening to God. And he's saying, God's agenda is more important than mine. The story that God's writing is more important than the story I've experienced to this point. You see, in the center of their relationship is God. When he says, I am God. Not you, not Joseph. And you don't read it recorded in here any place, but I believe with my whole heart, because Joseph was who he was, that there was a moment where he was with God and God said, listen, I'm bringing dad back into your life. And I know you're a grown up now. And I know you're powerful. And I know you're influential. And you are actually going to care for your family. I want you to respect him. I want you to listen to him. Because your dad, and what we see is, Jacob over and over again reminds Joseph of their roots. He has to be buried, not in Egypt, but with his ancestors because God is doing something through their family. And don't lose sight of that. They're very different. But when they defer, amazing things happen. So while each generation is different, every generation should be deferent. And here's how I see this playing out. I was introduced to this concept in lighting which I don't fully understand, but I'll do my best to explain it. There are four primary colors in a picture that you see projected onto a television or a computer screen or a wall. And those, letters, or those colors are represented by four letters, C, M, Y, K. Uh, C is for cyan, or, which I thought was red, but I guess it's blue. Um, and so in every picture that you see on a screen or you see on a TV, there's some degree of blue in there like you see on the the screens in front of you. There's also a degree of magenta in every picture. And that's that more pinkish kind of color. And think about that. You don't realize that or notice it necessarily, but there's a layer of that color in everything that you see. There's also a layer of yellow. Yellow shows up in one degree or another on every image that you look at. And then the K is for black. Now, standing alone, these four pictures are not that pretty. They're not that impressive. But when you bring all of them together and you sit them on top of each other, an amazing picture is the result. That's not a separate picture. That's just the four of them put together. And it makes me wonder, with all these different generations, what happens when we get them all together and we blend them in with one another, and we let them fade through each other a little bit, there's beauty in the result. And that's why I'm coming to this place believing that God actually built it that way. So that these different generations with these different walks of life would come together so that God can do what only God can do. That's what happens with Jacob and Joseph. They come together, they cross-fade generationally, and God does this incredible thing through their family. As you come to the end of Genesis and you launch into Exodus, this is where we learn about the Israelites, the family of Israel, the descendants of Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham. All because the generations found a way to respect and listen to one another. Beautiful picture. So how do we do it? How do we live like those I think there's two really simple questions we can ask when it comes to those that are in generations different than us. First one is this, how can I help them? And that question is not meant to be arrogant. Like, how ignorant are they about something that I'm not ignorant about and I'm going to inform them and be the genius in their life? No, uh, that's not the goal at all. In the same way that that's not Joseph's spirit when he's helping his family. His spirit was, how can I help my family? God's given me this place of influence. God's given me this authority. So how can I help my dad? How can I help Benjamin, by the way, one younger than him? 
I wonder what it would look like if that became the question that we were asking ourselves when we were interacting with people of other generations. How can I help them? Whether they're in a generation under or a generation above us. Second question is, how can I learn from them? You see both of these come up in Jacob and Joseph. How can I help? Well, I can feed. I can remind him of his roots. Well, what can I learn? Well, I can learn how Egypt works and organization and all of that kind of stuff, and I can learn how to father my children and keep them connected to God. You see these two questions play out. And I wonder if in a church like ours, which, by the way, is the best metaphor, the best word picture ever for what we're talking about, because literally every generation is represented in this room, in this community. What would it look like if those were the questions we were always asking about the other generation, instead of how are they wrong, how are they mixed up, how are they backwards? Or how do they just not get it? I think, I think, we would be a church unlike any other church that's ever been on earth. Because we would refuse to allow the differences to get between us. And our goal would be this picture that God's painting through all of the generations. So, it would be cool, right? So, like I said, we're filled with this here. It's baked into who we are. And I thought it would be really cool this morning if I introduced you Uh, to a pair of people (coughs) who live that out. I want to introduce you to Don Tremper and his grandson, Seth Taylor. And I'm going to let them share with you what it's looked like for their two generations to come together and what the result has been. Take a look at this video. Favorite memory I have of Grandpa would be when we used to go up north every single year and he would go swimming and I have a hard time floating in any sort of water and he would be sitting there floating, hat on his head, with his feet out of the water, barely moving his fingers. It's very frustrating, actually. It's going back to junior high with Seth when he was wrestling and he'd walk around and talking to the opponent's parents and shaking hands and then going out on the mat and demolishing their kid. And then afterwards, hope, helping the kid up and say, I hope you're okay. I would say the secret to the strength of, between me and Grandpa would be the amount of time that we spend together. Uh, besides the five or so years in Colorado, I think I saw them once, maybe twice a week. I think one thing we talk together and we have for a long time. It started back when Seth was just a baby, when we took care of them on the Wednesday nights, uh, when their parents were at Impact. We had a lot of Wednesday evenings there together, talking, laughing. My take on Bible stories, which were very different than the usual, and just getting along well together. The vacations were good, sitting sometime fishing together, and uh, just the pride I had also in seeing Seth grow up and grow up strong in, uh, in so many ways. It's grateful. So one thing that I wish my grandpa knew about my generation is that we do not think with our minds at all and just think with based on emotion, which I would say is true of most of my friends, actually. I think Seth does understand my generation somewhat, more than many, because I think he's got great insight into people. And probably just the idea about how fast my generation is now in decline and how less we are and how fast things are going and to realize that life is quick and life does draw quickly to an end and uh, just the idea about making the most of every day. I would say the biggest similarity besides our wonderful good looks um, would be the way that we crave knowledge and wisdom. I think the biggest difference between the two of us is Seth is a natural athlete and I really have to work at it and that's something. And um, Seth also, I think, has got more of an extroverted personality. I sometimes I wish I had, reaching out to people. He's really good at it. There's um, 
lot of similarities I think we have. And one thing I've been really gratified to see Seth's reading. In fact, he, some of the things he's been reading of Schopenhauer and Kierkegaard and some of the others have been blowing my mind. And I have to go back to my Philosophy 101 book to realize what he's talking about at times. But just the hunger for knowledge is something that I'm really pleased with. I'd say the top two or three things that Grandpa has taught me. Uh, the first one is be like Christ in everything. Uh, the second would be love people and everything. And then the third would just be to think through decisions. The things that I've learned from Seth over the years is first of all is an indomitable spirit of positive action and doing things, willing to try a lot of different kind of things. I think his uh, learning is something that I appreciate very much. And I also think though his desire to be a strong warrior for the Lord is very, very important. And it's something you don't always see, willing to stand out, willing to, to uh, grow, willing to study, willing now as he's come back here to the area to lead. And that leadership is, is a wonderful thing. You can teach me a lot, Seth, because I think that each generation learns from the other. It's a mistake when the older generation does not learn from the younger generation. And there's a sense of positive exuberance. You've gone through quite a few challenges uh, and uh, just the excitement I think you have for life. And uh, it's just a neat thing. And also the fact you're, you're willing to be identified with an older generation sometime. We can even go out to eat together and you're not too embarrassed. And I think that's pretty good. You could teach me so much about life itself. Uh, everything, how to act, how to treat people, how to seek out the truth. And I say that because it's how you live. Uh, you live in a way where you actually don't even have to say those things and I can just see it. Seth, you've got a, a new young generation coming and again be consistent with that little guy and I want to be the model the best I can probably to be more in his memory than in actuality as he gets older but to bring him up strong in the Lord but uh, I know you will do well and I look to the next generation. is that it's true. That's who they are. That's really how they view one another. And it's a great lesson for us in how we should view each other. Those that are from different walks of life than we are. Different influences, different core values, but about the same thing. While every generation or each generation is different, every generation should be different. So this is what I want to encourage you to do this morning as you're thinking about this and praying through this. The band's going to sing a song for us in a minute. Uh, and the words have to do with, we're better together. And here's what I'm going to encourage you to do during that time. Be Seth or be Don and think about someone from a generation different than yours that's had an impact on your life. They've taught you what it means to serve Christ or they've taught you what it means to just be a decent person because maybe you're here this morning and you're not a Christian. That's okay. But think through, pray through, who has God brought into your life that's from a completely different generation than your own that he's used to bring you closer to him? And use this as an opportunity to thank God for that person. And here's how we're going to do it. You have a little sticky note on your Emmanuel life that you were handed on your way in. I'm going to encourage you during the next three or so minutes to, on that little sticky note, write the name of the person who is kind of on your mind, on your heart. And then maybe under that name, just a few words about what it is that they've taught you or what it is that they've given you in your life or your walk with Christ. And then after the song, I'll come back out and I'll remind you, but there are two boards in the back uh, that say generational crossfade on them. And here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to stick those sticky notes up on that board, and you're going to put yours in the generation that the person who you wrote down was born in, or your best guess. And here, here's what 
I want to do with that. If you are 50 years old or older, I'd love for you to think through a person younger than you. And if you're a person that's 49 or under, I want you to think about a person that's older than you. That's, again, played a major part in your life and how you've developed and, and grown up. Different from you, but someone that you respect. And you can have a few minutes to do that, and then I'll come back out after the song concludes, and we'll, and we'll talk about that again. So I just want to pray for you real quick, and then the band will sing this awesome song for us. Let's pray. God, um, I love that you are a God who doesn't have cast-offs, who doesn't have shelf life for people, who doesn't wait until people become a certain age to use them, but that you use all of us, especially when we're together, to further your kingdom. And God, we believe, I believe that you have set our church up to be an example of what it looks like for generations to work together for the same thing in helping people know you and grow to be like you. So as we reflect and we pray and we think and we listen, show us that. So, you've got that name. And on your way out, those boards are lit up, and I'd love for you again to take the name and stick it into the generation in which that person was born. Um, So if they were you know, like your grandpa, they might be in the builder generation, and that's where you would put them. And I think what you're going to see, because uh, first service is up there already, is that the board gets filled because God uses each generation to impact the other as he rolls out his plan for the kingdom. And here's my challenge uh, with that name. If you can, if it's possible, take them out to coffee this week. You buy. And share with them what they've meant to you, and share with them what they've taught you, and watch what happens. And I'll leave you with this. Just this week, on Tuesday, I got invited to go to lunch with some gentlemen who, I'm just going to put it this way, are more mature than me. Uh, They're sitting in this room, so i got to be careful how I say this. But I sat with them for an hour over a bowl of Culver's chili, and it was the best part of my week. You know why? Because they taught me more in that one hour than any other place in my life. Because I listened to them. I listened to how God is using them, even after retirement, to do incredible things. It was encouraging to me. I don't know if they were encouraged by me. I hope so. Uh, But I know that for me, it was great to have some time with someone outside of my generation teaching me Uh, how to navigate life just a little bit better uh, in this day and age. So I hope you've had a great morning. You can leave that sticky note on those boards. We will see you in seven days. Have a good one.